Women are breaking all types of barriers and especially that glass ceiling. We see cracks all in the ceiling and some for some industries, the ceiling is actually opening wide up. And so today we're gonna to talk about women working in the film and video production industry and how to overcome barriers in a male dominated industry. Welcome to the Empowerment Zone with Ramona Houston, where we zone in on black and brown relations and our journey to empowering our communities. Welcome to the Empowerment Zone. I am your host, Ramona Houston, and I am so, so, so excited to have our guest today, Virginia Diaz Laughlin. She is a film producer. And for more than 30 years, Virginia Diaz Laughlin has worked in the film and video industry in production management, a San Antonio native, one of my favorite cities. She graduated from the University of Texas with a degree in radio, TV, and film. And as you all know, I am also a graduate of the University of Texas, so we're fellow alum. Virginia is based in Houston and worked on commercials, feature films, television movies, and syndicated shows. Feature film credits include Rushmore, Apollo 13, and Selena. Selena is one of my family's favorite movies. We watch that all the time. No matter how many times we watch it, we still enjoy it. So we love Selena. As a production manager for three years for Judge Alex and Christina's Court, produced by 20th Century Fox, she managed a crew of over 100 and successfully managed a combined $6 million production budget. Christina's Court won three Emmys for Outstanding Legal Courtroom Program. In 2018, Adan Madrano, author and chef, reached out to Virginia to collaborate on a documentary based on his book, Truly Texas Mexican, A Native Culinary Heritage in Recipes. And as some of you listeners know, we had Adan on the Empowerment Zone recently, right before uh, the uh, documentary film came out. This film marks her first feature documentary as a producer, and the film has been broadcast on PBS and is available for streaming. Virginia is a member of the Texas Motion Picture Alliance and is involved in bringing more production work, especially Latinx projects, to Texas. She is also an active Texas ex and a member of the Houston Film Community Welcome, Virginia. I'm so excited to have you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ramona. Thanks so much for having me uh, on your show today. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to talk to you as a woman in the film industry and also a woman of color and also as a Latina in the film industry. I mean, you bring so many different perspectives to our audience and as a native Texan about uh, the uh the film industry and, and many of the challenges we face as women and also all the opportunities that exist in the film industry now. So before we get into that great uh, topic that you chose for our conversation today, can you tell our audience a little bit about your personal professional background? I always like to uh, give my audience a chance to connect personally with my guests. Well, wonderful. So. I was always interested in photography and filmmaking. When, so when I was a, a kid, I was the one running around with the Super 8 camera, making my own little movies. And it's just something that I'd always had an interest in, even, even as, as a young person. And then through high school, I was the school photographer. So I took those steps to learn the craft early on and really thought that that was a, a great place for me to expand or go to professionally. And I, I found that looking through a lens is, is a way to show other people and communicate with them. Not just, it's not just pointing a camera and just capturing what's there, but what you frame, what you choose, how, what angle you use, all those things, you're communicating something to the audience. It's not just an image without that this, you just reproduce. 
So I thought that was really interesting that the lens was a powerful tool. And so how did going from photography, how did you move from photography, photography to actually the film industry? The film industry. So what happened was I, I early on decided I wanted to go to the University of Texas because at the time they had one of the best uh, radio TV film schools here in Texas. There was Texas, Texas, Texas Tech as well had one. But uh, I'd always wanted to be a Longhorn. Now, you know, in San Antonio during Fiesta, guess who leads the parade? <laughs> yes, exactly. The Longhorn Band. <laughs> the Longhorn Band in Texas. Like, I've got to go there. Yeah, so the Fiesta was something my family went to almost every year when growing up. I know. And that was something we always looked to because we mm -hmm. knew, that, you know, mm -hmm. that the Longhorn Band was coming down the street. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, that looked like a great place to go. And it had the best. Thing. So I really set my sight on sites on doing that right in high school. I did go to a small private high school in San Antonio, uh, St. Francis Academy. Mm. And so they, fortunately, even way back then, they did have a college, college bound courses. And that was a long time ago, because you know, I've been in this a long time. So, uh, so that kind of helped in a way to prepare you to go on. And it was a very small school. Our graduating class was 50. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so it's a very small school. And so you have the opportunity to take those courses that would kind of get you on the path. And they did help you apply and learn how to get into college. So I was accepted there and immediately I chose my major. I didn't even think much about it. I knew I was going to go into the RTF program mm -hmm. from there and uh, knew then I had kind of transitioned over from still photography now into doing more and more motion picture photography, you know, eight, super eight and eight millimeter and 16 millimeter. So I, and I knew I wanted to shoot again, the whole thing about having a lens and showing the world, you know, what you see through the lens. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how my interest, I kept my interest up and kept working at getting the skills to be able to shoot uh, whatever, whether it's on film or, or stills. So for our audience, RTF is radio, uh, television, film. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so upon graduation, how did you move from, you know, having a degree in uh, RTF and then moving actually into the profession? Because a lot of people have challenges with that process, how to get their foot in the door. Right. So, uh, um, yes, it is a hard thing. And it was a hard thing back then. But you have to look and go to where the work is. Mm. So normally, right after college, maybe I would have gone back to San Antonio, go back home. But at that time, Houston was where everything was happening. At that time, there was corporate filmmaking, commercial filmmaking, uh, industrial type filmmaking. So I couldn't get into the glamor side of it right away. So I learned how to shoot training films. Mm. You know, those wonderful and industrial training films, you know, uh, for example, like for a chemical company, uh, I did things where I would go out to the field and show how you use a particular chemical out in, on the farm. So I wasn't, you know, it wasn't the glamorous stuff right away. It was the go to the cotton fields, shoot the pesticide kind of mm -hmm. thing. But you learned your craft that way. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. learned how to make films that way. I remember the the editor, who was also a UT grad at this one place that I worked, told me, don't, don't come back with all the, without all the footage I need. You need to think out there. You need to bring it back to me I don't, or don't come back. <laughs> so, you learned pretty quick and you had, you had to get it. There was no going back to get it. Mm -hmm. So you learned quickly. I landed in a company that fortunately had a spot for me to learn many different professions. At that time, they had a need for someone that could be a production coordinator, a administrative, and go out and shoot. So hmm. that was something that I would tell people that that's, you need, do whatever you need to do to get in. <laughs> it may not be that you're gonna be uh, filming on your first day and out on the set doing that work. You may be in the office coordinating it or doing the administrative work for it for a while before you have an opportunity to go out and do what you, your passion is and what you really wanted to do. So do what you have to do, whatever you need to do to get in. Mm -hmm. That would be a, a really good lesson for young people to 
kind of take heart. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you want to be in other, in other industries, you want to be a computer programmer. Well, you may not be on the big, huge project to start with. You may have to start on something very small and something that's not really what you want to do, but you learn from it. And then you also learn, um, sounds like you were doing a lot of multitasking. So you learn yes. all aspects of production, which really come into play later on when you do have the opportunity to work on those big jobs. Huh? Yes, it does. And it opens more doors for you. Mm-hmm. So say a project, a film project comes in to your city or a commercial and there's so many spots open and well, you know, this person is already taken the a lead spot you wanted, there, there's other opportunities to still get in because then you meet people, mm-hmm. you learn to work with those people. If they really, really like your work, you may be the first one in on the next one. Mm-hmm. That's what you have to realize, you know, it's, that that's a way to overcome the barriers too. Great advice. Great advice. So tell us uh, your perspective. I know you're uh, talking about women in the film industry and <clears throat> how to overcome barriers uh, in, in the industry. What advice do you give to women and what, what are the opportunities that exist today and what are some of the challenges and what advice do you give women to make sure that they um, use all the skills and talents they can in order to get into the door so my one of my one of the biggest things that is now helping women I think is is networking and talking there is a for example there is on Facebook a group called Women working in reality TV. Mm. Okay, and the great thing about that is that's where you you find jobs. You know, I there are postings. I'm a producer in Atlanta, and I'm looking for field producers, whatever. Um, there are also think times when we're working with a difficult person, or we're on a crew, and you're working with someone, a guy who's just giving you all kinds of grief. So a lot of times people will post or women will post on that Facebook page. Here's my situation. You know, I'm the, I'm the uh, assistant camera person and the director of photography is this guy who's like really has a lot of experience. He's been around. He can kind of do whatever he wants because he has that reputation and he doesn't have to really be nice to everybody because he's in the, he's in this position. What, what can I do? What, how can, what do you all suggest? How do I work with them? And you get all these responses from other women who are, have been in that situation. You know, the more uh, experienced ones will tell you, okay, here's, here's the steps that you need to do. Try this and try that. And you just get this whole, the support and also the suggestion from the women of how, how to negotiate this so that you come out, you know, you're professional, and you, you know, maintain, they maintain, they respect you and, and you maintain all that without just becoming someone who's a problem on the set. You don't want to be that person that nobody wants to work. With. Isn't that something? Uh, so there's this website where women are learning how to manage different people and manage different environments. Yes. Yes. And it's really, it's really helpful. And anyone, you know, you, you can post, or ask any question, you can post a job, you can get help even with the things that all independent filmmakers or people that work in the industry need. How do I set up my S Corp? Do you, uh, hey, I'm in Houston. Do you know an accountant who's used to working with our industry and knows things? Uh, so it, we didn't have that before. I think we relied on things like uh, talking to your other uh, production people when you were on set, you mm-hmm. relied on that. But now mm-hmm. with this kind of virtual family, <laughs> production family, you can get all kinds of valuable help. There's another website called, for those that are producers, called Dear Producer. And uh, you can go to that as well. And they discuss problems. They have webinars that you can get on. How do I do funding? What's the new distribution in process in COVID? How do we do it? You know, how do I how do I get my film out there? So, dear producer has also been 
really helpful. So there's so many ways now that weren't available before. Uh, before all this, I think the main thing was networking or joining organizations. You know, those, it used to be social happy hours, but it was a time to get to know your, your, your film community and be able to reach out to those people when you needed something. Wow. That's an, uh, that, <laughs> that's a great um, resource for it people who, who are going in. And these are seasoned professionals and professionals. and probably yeah. people who know who you're talking about too. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. And, and right now it's a great thing because all, they are all posting any kind of job openings that they have. And some of them are just, you know, first job production assistants, you know, uh, all the way up to, you know, I'm looking for a, a, a seasoned uh, on-site producer. So all, the whole gamut, every position, camera, makeup, hair, you know, uh, sound, everything is on there. So it's a really good way to get involved with that mm-hmm. and start building your own uh, image of I'm a, I'm a PA and I'll do whatever you need for me to do. The word gets out. That's how you end up being on like every show that comes in. So can you tell those websites again for our audience? Yes, the, on Facebook, there is a group called Women Working in Reality TV. Okay, and then there's uh, another one, uh, there's a website called Dear Producer. And uh, you can go, they have uh, regular newsletters and webinars that you can uh, listen to or participate in. Uh, but they're very helpful for people that are now producing or also trying to figure out distribution for your film or your project. It's a very different landscape now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It changed so much with COVID that we're all trying to figure it out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What does does Netflix want to see? What is, how do you get into Amazon? What, how do you do that now? Mm -hmm. And that's a great resource to do that. So when you're, Looking back on your career and what you've accomplished uh, thus far, what are some of your favorite projects that stand out for you? Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you two. Okay. And one I just thought about the other day and it, because of the topic that we were talking about, um, women working in a, a male dominated industry. So right when I got to Houston, I went to work for a company that was established here that did commercials and and did a lot of the training films and other things. And I was fortunate enough to get on that company based on my final, the final project I did at UT uh, as a uh, cinematographer and production coordinator, manager and all that. So the one day they came up with a question for the people on staff that said, okay, we have a project. Uh, It's to go offshore um, over the new year's Eve weekend and document uh, one of the major oil companies building a platform. This is 75 mm-hmm. miles offshore and out, of, out of Galveston. Who wants to go? So, you know, the position for the person that was shooting the film was already taken, but they had a spot for a photographer. And so I was like, me, you know, take, pick me. I'm, I'm going, I'm gonna go on that trip. Um, and I'm, I'm talking about this because one of the most important things I think is to have support, not only within the work community that you have, but also in your personal relationships. Mm-hmm. At that time, I was seeing someone who was not keen on me being mm-hmm. gone. Mm-hmm. New Year's Eve, it was our first New Year's Eve. We've been Especially. dating. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. And I'm like, oh, uh, no, I'm going. <laughs> so, you know, and, and that was one of the best experiences I've ever had. So I was on a barge, 75 miles off the Gulf of Mexico Hmm. on New Year's Eve, we were on the bridge of the barge with the the crew, the officers were all Dutch, the crew was all Spanish and we're toasting (laughs) to stars, you know, uh, with our glasses of champagne and that's how we brought in the new year. So that was one of the most unique memories that I had. And, you know, as long as you're a professional in that, all those men, they all respected you and they, you know, got what you needed and did little, little things for you, but realized that you were there with the job to do, which was to document this lift of, and of the building of this platform. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That was one of my funnest, funnest things. And of course, the next thing is, is working on Selena. 
uh, that turned out to be an eight month project. Hmm. Very long. So I was on from the very, very beginning when they were just beginning to scout locations and that. At that time, I had moved into location management hmm. uh, from working as a, a shot film. I was a production manager, production coordinator. Um, but this opportunity came up as a location manager and I knew it was gonna be a once in a lifetime show. Um, the most wonderful thing about that show is I'm going to say 80% of the crew were all people of color, Hispanic, Puerto Rican, um, you know, people from Mexico. Uh, and he had people from all over the country, from LA, from New York, from Florida, from everywhere. So, and that was probably one of the few times where I was on a crew where it was primarily people of, of color. And there hasn't been any other since other than our film that we just, our documentary that we had just uh, completed and it's, it's airing now. So that was, working on Selena was one of the most unique experiences ever. Uh, we were uh, very close to Abraham. Uh, Abraham had a, uh, we were our location managers, but he called us the locators. So we would go down to Corpus and meet with Abraham and he'd, put us in his big old suburban and drive us all around Corpus and kind of show off us. These are my locators who are working on the film for us. Uh, and he was a very, very unique person, individual. And he was there every day when we filmed. Wow. It's been a very hard time because it was only like two years after mm -hmm. her death. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were filming in real locations. We were filming in the, the recording studio where she recorded mm -hmm. with her recording engineer. So every day there was it, was, it was a very unique feeling. Some days there were tears. It was very hard for, for some of the people that were there. Suzette, you know, came to the set. Chris was there, but not very much. Abraham, though, was there every day. I remember the most, I guess the, the most special memory is uh, when um, Jennifer comes out the first time as Selena, it is when we're filming the second week, the big Alamo Dome or... Um, concert mm -hmm, that was mm -hmm. a livestock mm -hmm. show. Well, we shot it at the Alamo Dome in San Antonio, mm -hmm. and and so it was that it was a very very special day. And I remember Abraham standing against a stack of speakers by himself, and he's just watching Jennifer be Selena. So it, you know it was, it, and we just left him, just let him stand there and take it in because I know for him that had to be so hard. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So hard. And that was the, the uh, Houston fair scene. That yes, was, that um, was the Houston rodeo mm -hmm, scene, which mm -hmm, she's in the, mm -hmm, the purple outfit. Mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. was the first, very first time we saw Jennifer as Selena. Wow. And that was like an iconic moment because that was her last yes. big performance. I'm surprised y'all yeah. shot that first. You we know, first. first. Yeah. So mm -hmm. she had about a week uh, prior to that. The week prior, we were shooting all the scenes with the little Selena, mm -hmm. the family mm -hmm. and, the, mm -hmm. and that. And so then right the second week was we we're going to open with with those scenes. Uh, so Jennifer was getting ready, you know, was getting ready for her role, I'm sure, all this time. And then to capture that, I think she did an amazing job of capturing her. And the team did an amazing job of transforming her. And to look, I mean, you just you yeah. swear it was Selena. <laughs> You know. Yeah, that, that was an amazing scene. I know um, I was a student, a graduate student at the University of Houston uh, when she performed at the fair. And I remember uh, my pro professor, uh, Sa Sa uh, Dr. San Miguel, he was talking about uh, either he was going to the show or he was upset that he didn't get to the, go <laughs> to the show. But I remember us having a conversation about, about her, her about her performing at the uh, at the Houston Rodeo because the Houston Rodeo is a big big deal uh, in right. Houston, right? Mm. And that was y'all's first scene. Um, you, Montezuma Esparza, what yes. what he the executive producer on that, right? Yes, he was the executive producer on that. You know, and Gregory Napa was the the director. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, and and they were very supportive of bringing all kinds of people in into this and lots of people of color. So it was a, it was a unique opportunity at that time for, for yeah, our Ma people. And uh, Montezuma has such a uh, consciousness 
about yes. awareness of, yes. of that mm-hmm. and awareness of, of that and and to take the opportunities where we can to make that happen mm-hmm. to give them the give us the opportunity to do to work in our industry and work with uh, 80 percent of the crew being you know a hispanic latino puerto rican you know whatever origin i'm sure that was an incredible experience thanks for sharing that with us so uh, tell us about your most recent pro- project, um, uh, Truly Texas Mexican and the documentary and tell our audience all about your work with that um, film and also how they can check it out. I know it just came out March 1st, I believe. Yes, it just came out March, this year. March 1st. Uh, so I, I would just start with saying that I have never been in the position of a producer up until now. So, uh, but so, but I've done, as you said, I've done all the work in all the other uh, departments to be able to understand what a producer does. So I've been a production manager, a coordinator, mm-hmm. you know, done the administrative work, then actually gone out and sh- and you know and, and shoot shot a lot of a lot of things. So the you know the hands on experience is also something that's really valuable to have because you need that when you're trying to figure this all out. So I met Avan through a mutual friend. Uh, Rick Ferguson is, was the director of the Houston Film Commission. And Adan and he were friends. And he, he spoke to Rick, Adan spoke to Rick and said, you know, I really think I want, we wanna do this documentary, but I don't wanna produce it. You know, I, I, I wanna be the executive producer. I want someone else to do it. I don't wanna do it. I've done it before. I said, okay, so uh, Rick introduced us and we kind of hit it off. I read Adan's book, uh, which is, th- that is what it, how the documentary is based on uh, his book called Truly Texas Mexican uh, Native Culinary Heritage. Um, and so we started to collaborate on the project and I would say that would be in uh, 2018. So it's been a long, it's been a long project, but these you know, documentaries like this did take a long mm-hmm. time. So in 2018, uh, 2019, we got together. I decided to come on as his producer, and uh, we shot our documentary in the summer of 2019. I'm sorry, 2018. 2018. We shot in the summer 2018, and we spent nine days on the road in a little van going from Houston all the way down to South Texas. The other people on the crew, it was a very small crew, were filmmakers that Adan had met. Um, in his journeys and in his work. There were two Uruguayan filmmakers from Uruguay, Montevideo, Uruguay. And one was a director and one's a director of photography. So those guys were really instrumental in getting Adan to agree to do this. They said, you have a, you have a story here. You have a message to, to tell that no one has done before and not quite in this way. So they really convinced him to, do, to go ahead with this documentary. So we went for nine days, we shot interviews with home cooks, with archeologists, with uh, Native American elders. Um, And the film is really about the importance of women being the carriers of culture in a lot of different societies, but particularly in the Native American, um, in the Native American community here and that's something that we emphasized a lot. And we talk about their stories. These aren't you know, famous chefs and, and restaurant and famous, famous restaurateurs. They're the everyday people or the everyday places that you go to. And, and they cook this food that originated from traditions from the Native American people and the Native American foods that we had here. An incredible story, and especially when you center women of color, a lot of times we are put on the margins of stories. And to center uh, uh, particular in, in indigenous women and showing how they contribute to the, the, the passing on of culture uh, throughout our communities. Right, and how they did it in spite of the fact that the Spaniards had come in and colonized mm-hmm. and, and you know, were kind of trying to change over so that they would become a part of the Spanish community. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, the indigenous people kept, it was the only way for them to survive. Mm-hmm. 
-hmm. was to in, try to integrate and be part of it. But at the same time, they kept those cultures and, and they kept the traditions and they just kept passing them on. And it was primarily through, through the women and, and cooking. Mm -hmm. It's a great film. So if uh, our audience wants to check out that film, uh, could you tell us where to uh, stream it? Ah, wonderful. Yes. So the movie is called Truly Texas Mexican. It is available on Amazon, mm -hmm. Google TV, Apple TV, and YouTube. Also, if you'll kind of keep a lookout on your local PBS stations, it has been aired mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. in quite a few cities in, in Texas, also in uh, Colorado, Utah, Connecticut. I mean, we're still airing uh, in, in many different places. We are waiting for and hoping that soon it will be safe to have a live screening. Oh, wow. uh, so we are just waiting to get the word, hopefully soon, from the Houston Fine Arts Museum um, and also from U of H. And I think part of it uh, is going to be, will be in conjunction with Hispanic Heritage Month, mm -hmm. which would be mid-September. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So I think at that point, it should be getting safer to gather together and to go to the movies like we used to. And I think we'll be opportunities um, for those types of screenings. So you can come out and meet us, watch the film and we can talk about it. Um, I think that'd be a great, great opportunity. Definitely, definitely. And if y'all ever, or when, let's not say if, when y'all come to Atlanta, uh, let me know and I will be a resource in helping you promote it and get you connected to anybody you want to get connected to here in Atlanta. That, that would, would be a be great wonderful. experience. Really, really appreciate, really appreciate that. Because I think there'll be opportunities and I think especially during his Hispanic Heritage Month, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. where we will be all over the place. Yes, of course. If, you go and watch, if you're an Amazon Prime member, you can go watch it for free. Yes, yes. That's truly Texas Mexican. Uh, so we can't, uh, I encourage uh, my audience to go check it out. It's a great film. So it was such a pleasure talking to you today. I mean, we covered so much and I, I just want to thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us and creating those um, cultural, um, how do I say it? I don't know what word to use that those cultural films that really stand the test of time in our communities. You know, when you look at, uh, Selena, when you look at truly Texas Mexican, they're, they're going to stand the test of time uh, in terms of really telling our stories and centering um, uh, Mexican Americans, Latinos, the Latinx community uh, in, in the story, in the American story. Right. And our, our film is, it teaches you some history that mm -hmm. you may not mm -hmm. be aware of, mm -hmm. and also brings it into current, current day and what mm -hmm. is going on now uh mm -hmm. and so you'll you'll learn a little bit we've had many people want to learn so much more so mm -hmm. we're hoping we can do more soon well thank you for joining us today and you're always welcome to come back to the empowerment zone if you ever have a project you want to promote or if you just want to give our audience some uh, uh encouraging words you're always welcome uh to to return but before you go can you uh, give our audience some calls to action in terms of uh, people who want to be in the film industry or people who just want to make sure that we continue to support uh, uh, films that are important to our stories? So for those that, that are interested in being in the film industry, uh, I encourage you to connect with people in your community people even with you know nonprofit projects and that it's it's and and doing the work you may have to do some work for free but you'll be known in the community you'll start networking that's that's the way to to get in and and you know do your do your job the best of your ability and people will recognize you for that beyond time you know um, and and do your job well and respect everyone else and they'll 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 remember you for that. And that's how you get on the next project. Mm -hmm. And that's how you get on the bigger one. And that's mm -hmm. how you get to where you really want it to be, which was to be uh, an editor or a director or something. That's how you do it. There's little stepping stones, but, but it's possible. Anything yeah. is possible. Of course, especially if you believe and you put in the work. 
And exactly. in terms of our audience, is there anything we can do more of to make sure uh, that we support uh, films that tell our stories? I think um, a big thing for me is to also encourage our filmmakers, young filmmakers in that. And that would, for me, is to mentor mm -hmm. someone. Mm -hmm. And it, it, you don't have to go and set up a huge mentoring program. Just find one person, exactly. one young person. And then if 10 people find one young person, then there's 10 people. And, you know, so it's the little, the little steps that in the end can make a, a big difference, especially if, if young people and women and people of color, we need to be there for each other. We need to su support each other. And then we'll, you know, we'll make a big splash, but it just starts with one little drop. Mentorship is key. So yep. if our audience wants to get in touch with you, how would they get in touch with you? Uh, I have a LinkedIn page, which I think okay. you have there. Mm -hmm. So okay. that we can do the LinkedIn page. It has my information and any other updates about the film uh, I put on there. Also, if you need to see any other updates, you can go to our Facebook page, uh, Truly Texas Mexican the Movie, and you can see any updates we have about articles that were written, reviews, where we might be screening next, uh, if you want to keep up with us too that way. Sounds great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. And you're always welcome to come back well, to the Empowerment you, Zone. Thank you so much. I just felt like this was, we only touched the surface. <laughs> we didn't even really get into things. I have all these things on my list. <laughs> exactly. That's why I was I saying know. you have to come back <laughs> so we can have it because there's no way to cover everything in just yeah. the short amount of time that we have. But I surely welcome you back anytime. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. A special thank you to the incredible team of the Empowerment Zone. Terry on Gully, theme song, NADWorks, digital support, and of course, our featured guest. If you enjoyed my podcast, please subscribe. We are on all of your favorite podcast platforms. Be sure to rate us on Apple Podcasts too. Thank you for your continued support.